Welcome to STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. Welcome to STEM Talk, where we introduce you to fascinating people who passionately inhabit the scientific and technical frontiers of our society. Hi, I'm your host, Don Kernagas. Also joining me today is Dr. Ken Ford, IHMC's director and chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee that selects all the guests to appear on STEM Talk. Hello, Don. Great to be here with you to discuss the interview that Blake Rushing and I did with James Briscioni. Yeah, I played hooky on this episode. I was pleased to have Blake join me as co-host for this episode as he is an accomplished chef in his own right. In addition to his role as IHMC's chef, Blake is chef owner at his restaurant, Union Public House in Pensacola, Florida. At first blush, one might wonder why is a chef appearing on STEM Talk? Has the Double Secret Selection Committee made a mistake? But of course not. James Brissione is a particularly interesting chef, working in the boundary spaces between the science of food, flavor, taste, and even AI systems, such as IBM's Chef Watson. Before we get to today's interview, we have some housekeeping to take care of. First, we really appreciate all of you who have subscribed to STEM Talk, and we are especially appreciative of all the wonderful five-star reviews that are piling up on iTunes. As we announced in several earlier episodes, the Double Secret Selection Committee has been continually and carefully reviewing the iTunes reviews, with an eye towards selecting the wittiest and lavishly praise-filled reviews to read on STEM Talk. As always, if you hear your review read on STEM Talk, just contact us at stemtalk at ihmc.us to claim your official STEM Talk t-shirt. Today, our winning review was posted by someone who goes by the wonderful nickname Butronical. And here is the review along with the official word of the day, mellifluous. I like that word, mellifluous. Here's the review. I'm continually enthralled by the variety and depth of ideas presented here. Also, it is rare that one finds great minds matched by great voices. Given the ketogenic bent of certain of the interviewers, perhaps mellifluous is the wrong term, but I'll use it nonetheless. That is indeed a blushingly wonderful review. Thank you, Butronical, and all the other STEM Talk listeners who have helped STEM Talk get off to such a great start. Okay, now on to today's interview. James Briscione and his wife, Brooke Parkhurst, both hail from Pensacola, Florida, and now reside in New York City. James's kitchen career started humbly, washing dishes at a now-closed restaurant on Pensacola Beach. But his trajectory was not flattened by that start. Instead, it turned upward rather steeply. At age 24, James became chef de cuisine at the Highlands Bar and Grill. Now, as a personal aside, this restaurant has, over the years, been one of my favorites and I am a huge and enduring fan of its chef owner, Frank Stitt. Chef Stitt must have been very impressed to entrust the reputation of his restaurant to one so young. From the Highlands Bar and Grill, which is often regarded as one of the top couple restaurants in the South, there are not a lot of places that can be said to be a clear move upward in the food firmament. Yet, James managed to accomplish exactly this with a move to New York City's restaurant Danielle, where he worked as sous chef. The chef owner and namesake Daniel Baloud is a legendary character in the restaurant world, and the cuisine aims for perfection and sometimes reaches it. In 2012, James became the Director of Culinary Development at the Institute of Culinary Education. James is the first two-time champion of the popular Food Network show Chopped and author of three books, Just Married and Cooking in 2011 with his wife Brooke, Cognitive Cooking with Chef Watson in 2015, and The Great Cook in 2015. Of perhaps most interest to those of us at IHMC, starting in 2012, James began working with IBM and the Chef Watson development team to understand how flavor compounds and ingredients translate from a database to the kitchen. The food and ideas that James has created with IBM has been featured in the New York Times, The New Yorker, NBC, BBC, NPR, Time Magazine, and hundreds of outlets around the globe. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM talk. STEM talk. Talk. STEM Talk. Hello, this is Ken Ford, chairman of the Double Secret Selection Committee. Hi, this is Blake Rushing. Welcome to STEM Talk, James. Thank you. Excited to be here. Yes, welcome, James. Blake, thank you. Let's start at the beginning. What did you eat 
growing up. <laughs> Any notable family cooking traditions or strong food memories? Um, just a couple, really, and they were all from my Italian grandmother. Um, my mom, who I'm sure is going to be listening to this, is notoriously not a great cook. Uh, she made dinner for us every night at home, um, and you know, we always had a good meal on the table, um, but nothing memorable, nothing, you know, nothing that really stood out. I, a shepherd's pie was one of my favorite things that mom made, and it was, it was great. Um, but some of those you know, kind of special meals with grandma, you know, the good, the good Italian grandmother. Um, I remember I loved her chicken cacciatore, but I hated the mushy carrots that uh, were always in that. But, of course, a good Italian grandmother would never throw away the carrots that were cooked along with the chicken. And, but they, they always bugged me. Um, she made the greatest mashed potatoes in the world, which is not something you would think about from the Italian grandma. Um, but just, you know, that, that Sunday red sauce with the meatballs and, and sausages just simmered in tomatoes all day long. And, uh you know, loads of those those meatballs just loaded down with pecorino cheese are, are one of the, one of the great memories. Yeah, it sounds pretty awesome. So I uh, understand you never went to culinary school, and I find it awesome how some of the greatest chefs in the world have never gone to culinary school. And um, it's uh, it's neat that now you're teaching at one of the top culinary schools in the country. It's you know it's really funny, and uh, you know facing my students every day, and, and they you know often ask me about culinary school or what it was like when I went through or did I go through, and I'm. I was thinking, well, well, no, I didn't. But, you know, I was really lucky to start cooking, uh, get into kitchens at the age of 16. Um, so I had, you know, a number of years where I could get by making no money whatsoever and kind of work my way up through the ranks and, and learn the kitchen that way. And I think, you know, as much as we can try to teach in culinary school, like the true learning of cooking doesn't happen until, you know, you're in the kitchen, you know, every day. And, doing the same task over and over. I mean, you know, we'd give a, a very thorough overview of of how to cook and techniques. And, you know, my hope for our students is when they leave, they go, oh, right, I've done that before. Okay, right, this is how we did it. And then as they do it hundreds more times, they get really proficient and great at it. Because that's, you know, it's Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours. That's, you know, what you need to be an expert. From what we understand, you uh, discovered that you loved being in the kitchen at your first job uh, here in Pensacola, working at Jubilee Restaurant, which, alas, uh, is no longer with us. Can you tell us about that experience? The back of restaurants can be interesting places in the Chinese use of that word. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, I mean, I, I loved everything about it. So I was playing football in high school, and I mean... The kitchen was just a giant extension of the football locker room. It was the same camaraderie and the same kind of feeling and, you know, inappropriateness all, you know, went on in the kitchen the same way it did. And I think, I mean, I was truly hooked in on my first day. I was 16 years old. I showed up for my first shift as a dishwasher and um, a dishwasher had just quit that day. So it was now me and a bus boy, you know, washing dishes for Two, actually, two restaurants that oper op operated simultaneously. There was, you know, the fine dining upstairs and a casual beach cafe downstairs. And we're, you know, going through you know, over 800 dishes a day, uh, you know, between those. And, you know, next thing we know, we're just like plowing through, scrubbing pots, running dishes through the machine. And it's midnight or later, I think. And uh, you know, one of the managers came back with a tray with two beers and an ashtray on it. And I was like, guys, you've had a hell of a day. Here you go. And he goes, I did not give this to you. I'm just going to put these down right here. I'm not giving them to you. Uh, I think it's okay for me to say that now because the restaurant doesn't, yeah. is, is, is gone. Um, and, Statute of limitations. Yeah. So I was 16 years old. They gave me a beer and let me smoke a cigarette. I was like, this is the greatest job. And, the, and, it, was, and it was 1 a.m. by the time I left there. The first shift beer. That was, that was the greatest thing. I mean, I was like, I love this. I Surprised love this. it was a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> What came between that experience and working at a top-tier restaurant like Highlands Bar and Grill, which is, by the way, one of my very favorite restaurants? Oh, uh, you know, Highlands, Highlands was an incredible experience. Um, but between washing dishes and, and finding myself in the kitchen there in Birmingham um, was a lot of trying not to be a chef, basically. I uh, had a great time uh, working in that restaurant in Jubilee and in Pensacola Beach. Um, and did it for, you know, for about three years, all the way through high school. But 
said, you know, there's no way I'm going to spend the rest of my life in a kitchen. This is this is crazy. Um, I want to do I want to do something else. So I actually um, was in Birmingham working on a degree in sports medicine. And my first two years um, working towards sports medicine, doing all the anatomy and physiology and kinesiology and biochem and everything that was required. And after my every summer, I would go back to the restaurant and work because it was great great money, uh, you know, to to make for the year working there in the summers. And and I still enjoyed it. But after my second summer back, I just it something clicked, and I was like, this is this is it. This is what I want to do. Um, so when I got back to school, I changed my degree from sports medicine to nutrition, uh, which was an easy switch because the first two years are basically exactly the same. Uh, so I didn't lose any credits and I just plowed ahead and started asking all my friends. I didn't know anything about the food in Birmingham because I barely left campus to eat. And if we did, it was, you know, the cheapest thing we could find late at night. Um, started asking my friends, what are the best restaurants in town? Uh, cause that's where I wanted to go work. If I was going to cook, I wanted to be at the best place. And this chef Frank Stitt's name kept coming up. It was it was Highlands or it was Bottega. And so I went and knocked on the back door at, at Bottega restaurant and said, I want to work here. And uh, the kitchen manager kind of looked at me and I was, you know, wearing khakis and a shirt and a tie. And he was like, All right, what are you selling me? Are you, you know, you're not a cook. <laughs> yeah, you're selling wine. Yeah, you don't look like a cook. Uh, and I almost didn't get the job because I showed up in a shirt and tie, which is welcome to the restaurant industry. It's like that here too. <laughs> <laughs> We're uh, suspicious of people that show up in suits and ties. Uh, so I got a job as as the pizza maker, and uh, we have this incredible. Bottega has this incredible wood fired oven where they cook you know pizzas every night and do roast and and you know try to do actually a lot of the cooking out of this wood fired oven. Now my job as the pizza maker was the only truly make the pizzas, not make the dough, um, not cook the pizzas, but just stretch the dough, put the toppings on, and then hand it off to the guy who put actually put it in the oven and took it out of the oven and served it. Uh, that and lugging firewood in from the back shed to store underneath uh, underneath this giant hearth oven um, so that we could keep the fires going all night long. And after a month or two of that, I you know graduated and started being allowed to cook a few of the pizzas, and then eventually was running the oven on my own, and just you know kept my head down and worked hard and, and worked my way up through the ranks from one restaurant to the next to you know ultimately uh, my position at Highlands. So um, <clears throat> Frank Stitt is an absolute rock star in my book. Um, I know you got your foot in the door by knocking on the back door and getting in there, but to be chef de cuisine at such a renowned restaurant at twenty four. Um, when I was 24, I was getting pots and pans thrown at me in London, burned on the back of my arm, <laughs> and punched in the kidney. Um, so, what? How did you get there at 20, by 24 years old? You know, it. Uh, I mean, working for Frank was was an incredible experience. He's he's an amazing chef and and such a great leader. And um, I mean, there's just a real sense of of family uh, that he fosters in in all of his restaurants. And I mean, like now to the point that he even has, you know, a farm outside of town that he operates, that his cooks go and, you know, work the farm with him. And he's, you know, out there in the field harvesting vegetables that come back to the restaurant each day. Um, but, you know, it was it was I was I showed up every day and I was always there and I was always there early. And, you know, you hear it in sports always about the quarterback, the first one, the first one to arrive and the last one to leave the practice facility every day. And that's, you know, what I try to do as as a young cook. Um, you know, I try to show up early. I wanted to learn. I wasn't going to culinary school. I wanted to learn about pastry. So I would show up in the morning uh, and help Dahl Lester, the amazing pastry chef there. Um, and I just wanted to spend every moment I could in the kitchen. And I think, you know, he saw that passion for me. I wasn't necessarily the greatest cook at the time. Um, but he saw the passion, I think I like to think at least in me and, and the drive and, and, and the desire to be there. And, um, I think that, you know, gave him enough faith to, to give me a shot. Nice. Um, so Danielle Ballou is one of the top chefs in the world. Uh, he seems to have it all figured out and just such a great attitude. I was able to work with him for a couple of days up in, um, Vancouver with JFK and his other top guys. Um, and, uh, he, when he was taking over Lumiere, um, all, all very calm, but when he got a little bit wound up, he would stomp his foot and all of them would jump. I mean, just the tiniest little bump of his foot. And uh, so I'm assuming he's always not that calm. He's, <laughs> he's. I mean, it, 
exactly as you described it up to that moment <laughs> you know everything's great we're having a good time we're laughing he's a he's a you know just the you know true joie de vie of you know the the french exactly what you would expect um happy having a good time laughing making fun of all the cooks and you know we're telling them a story oh chef guess what this guy did last night when we were out you know and he's laughing and, and that's all fine but you know once service started then then things changed and and you know everyone was everyone was quiet and focused and you know if if things weren't exactly the way they were supposed to be um then yeah that that foot stomped and and a couple words came out quickly in french and um things were corrected very quickly so there was there is you know i think uh, an incredible intensity that he has and i and i think that he has to have i mean to you know operate at that level and to have you know that pressure always on you um to you know to be at the highest level to always know that somebody's watching somebody's you know um to maintain those standards it's it's um uh, it's exhausting so you uh i heard you won chopped twice <laughs> i um i had uh some friends that won well, my head chef at savoy and uh, gordon ramsay nyc josh emmett um went on there and won immediately they of course said he was being too safe which we were j- joking around saying he was doing that but he did win um what do you attribute uh winning both times back to back well, like I've got to correct you. I actually won three times. Three times. <laughs> oh. oh. But but the pilot. I won the pilot, but that never aired. So okay. That's, a, that's just between us. We can count it. And whoever's <laughs> listening here. It is, I mean, I don't even know. It's, it's, again, I think, you know, for me, kind of the, always, the way I've always tried to conduct myself in the kitchen, I just always tried to do a little bit more than everybody else. Uh, you know, if I had a chance to, you know, make an emulsified sauce to make a sappy something that was that i knew the judges would go wow i can't believe he's trying to do that in 30 minutes that's what i tried to do every time i, I wanted just you know i always wanted to out hustle and that's kind of i guess what i've always kind of the way my whole culinary career has gone it's just always trying to out hustle the other guy and that's what i tried to do on the show and i think you know you it, there's there's a little bit of, of mind games to it and um i remember very well during one of the rounds, because when when you're in there in that kitchen, it's first of all it's it's insanely hot, and you always see the people dripping sweat. But you've got you know four stoves, four ovens set at 500 degrees. You've got four pots of boiling water, and you don't have any hoods pulling any of that heat or steam away. So it's just like a it's a warehouse essentially with you know four stoves running at full blast. Um, so it's always hot and intense in there, but. I remember one time we opened the baskets and whatever happened and I you know, went sprinting off to the pantry, grabbed a bunch of things and I came back and I was back at my station and I was flying through mincing an onion as fast as I could. And everyone else was still like running around the pantry gathering and you know, we can hear the judges. They're, they're just right there at the end of the table. It's so close. And so when they're having their little side conversations during the cooking, you can hear all of it. And Ted was talking to them. And Ted goes, wow, it seems like Chef James really has a great plan here. He's already back at the board uh, and he's re- putting something into motion. You know, he, he's really, you know, flying through this. I minced that onion. I scraped it off my cutting board into a bowl, stuck it underneath my station, never touched it again. <laughs> I, had no, I had no idea what I was doing at the moment, but I heard that. Everyone else heard that and they were like, oh, crap, I better get going. He's already back. He's already back cooking. And they're still, you know, running around trying to find their ingredients. So it was just like, I'm going to get. I'm, I'm going to at least give the impression that I'm super confident and I know what's happening here. That's be I fun. had no idea what I was doing. I never touched that onion. That's great. So to work in those uh, top restaurants like Danielle and all that, and I know you're working 17, 18 hours a day, super high pressure, and now you're the uh, director of uh, culinary development at the Institute of Culinary Education. Um, what's that like? It's, Com- di- <laughs> it's different. Um, it's, it's different. I mean, the, the hours are a heck of a lot better. <laughs> than they are in a restaurant. Um, but, you know, I, I took, uh, part, you know, part of that job was thinking that I would have, you know, more more time and I wouldn't be spending, you know, 14, 16, 18 hours a day in the kitchen anymore. And somehow I still find myself in the kitchen 14 or 16 hours a day. Um, but it's on so many different things. And, you know, kind of the freedom that that's allowed me now to, you know, work on these different projects, to to write books, to, you know, do different television projects, uh, to take on the Chef Watson project is, you know, that, I mean, if if I weren't at ICE, I never would have been a part of Chef Watson. Um, you know, as the, as the IBM engineers came came to ICE um, to kind of seed that project, I was, I was lucky, you know, again, it's kind of been another theme through my career of, being in the right place at the right time. Um, 
I think you work hard to get yourself into the right place at the right time, but then, but then that happens as well. It is said that 80% of flavor, or at least the perception of flavor, comes from our nose, and that it can take hundreds of compounds to create a single flavor. That's a lot more complicated than the five or six tastes that our tongues can detect. These are typically thought to be sweet, sour, bitter, salty, unami, and in recent times, fat. The notion of fat as a taste has been somewhat controversial in some circles. Molecular biologists have theorized that humans may have a plethora of other, as of yet, unspecified taste receptors, including fat. But many regard fat as the most recent candidate to be added to the pantheon of tastes, making six. Our tongues have receptors for detecting fat, but some question whether fat is, in a sense, a taste or an oral sensation, or perhaps both. Certainly, fat has a terrific mouthfeel. Do you have a view on on fat's place in the taste pantheon? I I think it is both. I think it's a, I, I mean, you know, y- I, I'm never going to be one to argue with science. I mean, we've identified receptors for it. So, uh, you know, it is a taste. It's something that the tongue can identify. And um, there's certainly just kind of in, in crafting a bite of food, it's, it's you know, mouthfeel is something that we think about. Um, so I think there is there is a feeling, but there's also that, you know, immediate sensation, um, you know, that, that the tongue picks up. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I'm, I'm kind of of that camp that, I don't know how it's taken us this long, but I think we're going to find out a lot more about what the tongue does. Um, I mean, I think, you know, if we think about basically what the tongue's job is, I always try to explain to people as it's a detector of nutrients and toxins. Basically, it tells you if something's going to be good for you to swallow or, or bad for you to swallow. And if it's going to be bad for you, it kind of signals your brain to, to spit it out or start coughing or do something to get rid of it. Um, because it's going to hurt your body. So I think, you know, all of these different nutrients that are essential for our bodies to function properly. I think I think we have receptors for all of those at the tongue because I think that's you know becomes part of cravings and your body knows you know what it needs and can sense whether it's getting it or not. Agreed, and uh, I mean people make a distinction between having a receptor and having a taste, but in the case of fat, we know that the sensitivity of the receptor is modulated by a protein called CD thirty six, and uh, people vary a lot in their ability to sense fat, and that seems directly connected to the level of that protein. Well, I think we're, you know, uh, just kind of as we say there, you know, we're, we're so bad with language, I think, because we talk about taste, and, and taste is one specific thing, and, and we, we don't talk about flavor, uh, you know, as much. I think we, I think we need to talk about flavor more and, and think about it more. Uh, you know, we think about aromas and, and things like beer and coffee and wine, but we don't put that same thoughtfulness to food always. And, and I think all of those same aromas and more exist in our food, um, you know, and, and, and a lot more because then we bring in all of the pyridines and pyrazines that, you know, come from Maillard reaction that add a whole nother level of, of flavor creation, uh, you know, in our food that don't exist. But yet we kind of still just think about the taste, and, and we mm-hmm. always we always use that word taste, um, even though it's a pretty limited scope of, of what taste actually is. Absolutely, that you know you're talking about the use of words and the the word taste, and it really has several common, different, but not completely unrelated meanings. You know, there's that old joke where one cannibal is talking to another, and uh, they're busy eating an unfortunate clown, and one cannibal says to the other. Does this taste funny to you? <laughs> <laughs> Brat Savrin, you know, he was awesome. Brat Savrin's classic book, The Physiology of Taste, especially the version edited or actually translated by MFK Fisher, is among the greatest works on food. Could you talk a little bit about the physiology of taste? You started going down this rabbit hole and uh, <laughs> the physiology of taste and smell and then the emergence of this wonderful notion of flavor. Yeah, well, I, I have a kind of a way I like to always tell people about this. And it's, if you, you know, imagine for a moment that you, you take a bite of cake, right? And the second, you know, first of all, you'll, you'll start to identify that cake as you bring the fork to your mouth because you're, you're smelling it. Um, and you're likely to smell, you know, whatever flavors may be in that cake. You might just smell the butter coming out of, you know, the buttercream and, and, and the sponge itself. 
But the second it hits your tongue, your, your tongue goes, woo, woo, we got sugar. I love this. Um, but that's about all your tongue can do. It's like, yeah, sugar, I can use this for energy. I love this. I want more of it. And it makes me very happy because, you know, we know now about some of the brain chemistry that goes along with um, ingesting sugar. That's an unfortunate brain. <laughs> has an addiction. It, 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 it does. Um, and so as it sits there in the tongue, your tongue's very happy because of this sugar. But then as you begin to chew and as it sits in your mouth, all these little molecules, these volatile compounds start coming out of, or they are coming out of the cake, and they make their way up the back of your throat and, and into your nose and even in the back of your throat and uh, in your cheeks, there are receptors that are just recognizing these little molecules. And now they're relaying to your brain, well, this is actually a chocolate cake. And uh, there, there's a little bit of a hazelnut filling and, and your brain is going, well, wow, this is, this is really delicious. And these are wonderful flavors. Um, and your tongue is just like, wee, I love sugar. And, uh, and that's kind of how taste works. I mean, <laughs> Maybe just oversimplified it just no. a, a tad bit, <laughs> but that's basically, that's basically the way it goes. Oh, I thought that was good. <laughs> STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. You know, you've been working lately with a variant for the last three or four years, I guess, of uh, a variant of IBM's Watson AI project that neatly defeated two recent champions in Jeopardy!, Helping humans explore flavor combinations seems like a much more interesting and useful application (laughs) than goofing around on a TV game show. As you probably know, AI has long been a primary research focus area here at IHMC. Can you talk a little bit about how Chef Watson can assist us as humans in combining ingredients in novel ways that provide great flavors? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's kind of this amazing thing that uh, you know we're we're able to do now, and understanding you know more, and it's it's a lot of um, obviously the science has been around for a really long time, but as as chefs, I think we're just coming around on this idea in the past ten or fifteen years about exactly what flavor is, how it works, and how you know we can understand our ingredients better by by looking at them through the compounds um, responsible for flavor, but. It is um, massive and complicated amount of information. And, but what we're able to do is basically kind of quantify flavor as data. Um, and then, you know, what the Chef Watson project is looking to do is, is basically sort and sift through that data in a very effective way uh, to help us see our ingredients differently. Uh, you know, there's, there's a theory uh, called the flavor pairing theory that started, started Actually, around the time you were, well, just a little bit after you were in, before you were in London, Blake, uh, you know, with Heston Blumenthal, and they found some really interesting combinations like ch- white chocolate and caviar, um, and wanted to figure out why did these taste so good together. Besides, you know, it was a great salty sweet combination, but there was more to it, and they found these, you know, flavor compounds that these ingredients had in common, and said, well, it seems like if these unexpected ingredients have these compounds in common, that that's going to make them taste good together. We're going to perceive that as, as a great combination. So they started looking at ingredients that way um, and, and found other really interesting combinations, things like pineapples and blue cheese, um, salmon and licorice, um, really weird and unexpected things that yeah, make you <laughs> exactly make you shake your head, um, but, but actually do, do taste good. And I think, um, but you know, when we're looking at thousands of compounds and trying to find the combinations, you need uh, either a heck of a lot of time to sort through them or you need some help. And that's a big part of, of what Watson uh, was able to do. Watson also sort of you know, understands different um, cultural ingredients. And so it's a way to discover new ingredients. And working through Watson, um, as it's sort of digested all the information about um, different cultures and ingredients common to those cultures, and it would generate a list of ingredients that we were supposed to use to create a dish. Often, the first thing I had to do was go, "Well, what is that ingredient? Because I don't, I don't know that one." Um, so, as you know, as a both as a means of discovery 
um, learning about you know, new ingredients and new cultures and seeing, and then kind of going into a flavor profile of this new ingredient that I've never even heard of and sort of understanding where it fits in the scope of a normal sp- of, of spices that I may you know, already be aware of. Um, you know, being able to kind of see that data in a different way or see that flavor as data and, and see your ingredients in a different way is, is sort of the key to the project. And it's just, you know, again, it's kind of just this massive amount of data that is hard to make sense of otherwise. Yeah, the fat duck was all the rage when we were there. All the chefs <laughs> couldn't stop talking about it. Just the the crazy stuff they were putting out, and even putting earphones on to listen to, That's right. to the, the sea. Uh, the and all seashell that. came yep. with a little uh, exactly. with a little earbuds, I, iPod, <laughs> iPod. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah, I love that. Um, so, what are some of your favorite? Uh, combinations, and then what's of course like the one that you said nope, that's that just can't be the computer's wrong. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, so the favorites, um, a very kind of gently cooked sous vide apple um, that's been surrounded with olive oil and fresh sage, and that I mean I've never really considered apples and olive oil together because it's you know. Uh, growing up and 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 coming up as a chef, it was always you know what grows together goes together, and um, olive, olives olives and apples don't grow together, and so there was never any you know thought that they should go together, um, and so you know that coming from apples always coming from a butter producing region, we've always cooked apples in butter, and it's always been kind of this this uh, combination that went together. Um, Watson suggested that apples and olive oil would be something that would taste good together. So, you know, we tried it out and we played with it a couple different ways. And this gentle poaching, this, you know, we actually cook them sous vide. So you get a little bit of an infusion of that olive oil into the apple. Uh, and then layering that with a very delicate flavor of sage is just one of the one of the most incredible things. And it's, and it's something I've kind of taken with me and brought into other dishes now. Um, olives, olives and cherries, we found another incredible combination with. Um, that works incredibly well together. We make a, a jam out of that that is probably the best condiment for a cheese plate ever. Um, things that we didn't think made any sense, um, mushrooms, strawberries, and chicken. What? <laughs> right. I mean, the mushrooms, you know, it's, it's, almost like, it's almost like a chopped basket, right? You're like, well, well, two of those make sense, but well, what the hell is that third thing doing there? Because that doesn't, that maybe could go with one of them. Uh, but this is, you know, just a, a fascinating combination um, that works really, really well. And as you know, we started playing with it, and we found different ways to utilize it. And this is, I think, you know, kind of the great thing, and and you know, that shows the true collaboration between man and machine. And in, in working with Chef Watson, is that Watson can tell us there are shared compounds between chicken and mushrooms and strawberries. Um, but it doesn't mean that you could just throw them all in a blender and it's going to come out and taste good. There's still, you know, you still have to kind of finesse just that perfect balance and that perfect combination out of those ingredients to truly you know, make it great. And, and you and I might, you know, approach those same three ingredients in, in two very different ways. And I think that's the coolest thing that, you know, we can identify these unexpected combinations or these new approaches to very familiar ingredients Um but we're all going to go about it differently, right? So we all have our previous experience that we're going to kind of implant our own personal style that we're going to, you know, impart into those ingredients. Um, so it's it's it, it truly is, you know, that again, just the collaboration between man and machine and, and and feeding creativity, not just saying here, cook this, it'll be good. I can't wait to work with those combinations. <laughs> What about the compounds themselves? Do you have a favorite compound? <laughs> Oh, so many favorites <laughs> of the compounds. Um, let's see. I'm trying to. Uh, they, I think that, you know, they all kind of you know line up line up into into different categories. Um, you know, one that I'd love to just kind of use to illustrate to people about how how these combinations actually do work, and there's you know there's really something to it, and it's not just a bunch of. Um, you know, chefs thinking they're being really smart and 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 cool by talking about this stuff. Um, four methyl pentanoic acid is a really interesting one. Uh, it's got this great floral aroma, but we find it in probably the world's favorite food. Uh, we find it in baked wheat, in tomatoes, and in cheese. It's so, pizza. It's a pizza. All right. So um, yeah. So we have scientific proof that pizza is delicious. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Um, 4-methyl pentanoic acid. That's, that's a fun one. Um, 
And then the one that we were just talking about with chicken and strawberries and mushroom is gamma dodecalactone. Um, which took me about three weeks to actually remember and learn how to say, (laughs) what was it again? Um, And it's got this, you know, really unexpected aroma. And I think that's, you know, kind of the the most interesting thing as as you really start working in this, you go, well, how could strawberries, mushrooms, and chicken even really have anything in common? Because I've smelled chicken, I've smelled mushrooms, and I smell strawberries, and they don't smell the same at all. Um, and, you know, as we kind of, as Ken, as you said, uh, you know, as we started off here, you know, a strawberry has 383 different compounds that make up the smell of that strawberry. So they're, you know, incredibly con- complex and they may not be the ones that we recognize right away, but your body is still sensing all of those to make up the overall, you know, aroma or the over- and the overall flavor of a strawberry. Um, so I think there's a lot of, you know, matching happens that, that we don't even realize. And, you know, gamma dodecalactone really smells like almost like suntan lotion, kind of, you know, tropical and coconut. Um, and we wouldn't expect that inside of our mushrooms, but it's there. Hmm. What about your friend, uh, mesifurane? Mesifurane. <laughs> uh, mesifurane is another, it's actually a key odorant in strawberries. Um, and it shows up in significant concentration. But if you isolated it and smelled it on its own, it would smell like a croissant. Smelled like butter and baked bread. Um, so it's, you know, once again, kind of one of these, you know, a, a great illustration of, of how it's the sum of the parts, right? It's like a, like a pixel in a photograph. You can look at a beautiful picture of a sunset, but if you get in close enough, there's one black square in there. But it was a sunset and it was vibrant and, and colorful and, and, and lovely to look at. But all I see is this little black square when we back out. We see the beautiful picture of the sunset. We need some mezzifurane air spray. <laughs> we, we, that, you know what? Put that on the list. We're gonna uh, and some. Maybe we. Maybe you know what? Let's let's make let's start a line of air fresheners for cars that could hang. Yeah. And it'll be the it'll be a, 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 a line drawing of the compound, and then they'll. It could be good <laughs> for restaurants. Really nerdy, really nerdy air coffee fresheners. shops that aren't selling enough <laughs> yeah. baked goods. You just. Spray it off with mesifurane. Yeah, little mesifurane candles burning in the corner. You know, I imagine that a program like Watson, uh, Chef Watson, might enable you to be both more creative and more efficient in the kitchen by acting as a sort of cognitive orthotic or a cognitive orthosis. Uh, is this true? And can you elaborate a little bit on this? Yeah, you know, it, it absolutely is. And I think, you know, Blake knows what it's like to try to create something, a new dish for the menu. I mean, uh, usually that process of creation for a chef looks like sitting down with a stack of cookbooks um, or, you know, a, a, a list of produce or, you know, whatever it may be and start sorting through and say, all right, well, I want to I want to make a duck dish. And, um, you know, you might first start with like kind of a, a word association game. You just play with yourself and you go, OK, I think duck, I think, you know, fruit, I think orange, I think cherries, I think sage and, and go down a list and you create your own list of ingredients you immediately associate with duck. And then you start flipping through cookbooks and trying to find, OK, well, you know, what are these chefs that I, you know, think are really smart and, and respect if what did they put with their duck? And you compile this whole big, long list of ingredients and then start, you know, isolating single ingredients from there and then putting them in next to the duck. And then you've got a list of ingredients that you're going to use or you think you're going to use with your duck. And then you go and cook it and you go, well, that one didn't work and that one didn't work. Let's swap these out. And so it's a, it's a long and complicated process. Um, and I've, you know, kind of, you know, liken it to, to something we hear about a lot these days, which is, you know, decision fatigue. Um, I mean, you can waste so much time and mental energy just trying to figure out which ingredients you're going to use before you even start the creative process. And then, you know, once you've, and then you've kind of, you know, used up so much of that mental energy that you don't, you can't be as creative as you want to be um, with your ingredients. But if you can start at a point and say, here's the ingredients I'm going to use. You know, I know that they're going to taste good together because we've got some evidence of shared compounds. And I know that these are going to work. So I'm going to stick with these ingredients. And then I can sit and just look at that list and go, well, what is an apple? I can think about the shape of the apple and I can think about the texture of the apple and I can think about, well, what forms could an apple take and what can I do with an apple and how can I transform an apple into something different? And I get to, you know, focus my mental energy on the ingredients themselves and how I can, you know, approach 
transforming them and making them into something that's you know more interesting and more exciting. That's a great answer. In the past, you've compared using Chef Watson method to the golden ratio in painting. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, I mean, it's there's there's a hidden pattern that we're not always aware of. I think, and you know, as uh, I think there's, you know, two people, two types of people who, um, you know, who are creative and, and ones who paint a picture and without realizing it are painting kind of in the format of the golden ratio um, because they're geniuses and they're incredibly talented and naturally gifted that way. Uh, and then there are people who have to learn what the golden ratio is first and then try to hone their craft to to focus in on that. And I think, you know, as you, as, you know, as, as you alluded to before that Watson being somewhat of an orthotic, something that's going to, you know, help you get to that point. So here now, again, I can kind of find those hidden, that hidden pattern in the food, uh, that's going to help me be better at what I do. And I think that's really kind of, you know, that's really what this is all about. Sure. I mean, we see the golden section throughout nature in mathematics it's described by the Fibonacci sequence, actually, in math. So I understand the computer has helped you come up with some different combinations you wouldn't have expected before, um, but it has also confirmed some classic combinations that all chefs know that juniper and venison go to well, or, or this and that go well. What are some of the classic ones? Yeah, I mean, you know, they're... We we'd always kind of you know shy away from those because we wanted to be as as we were creating with Watson we wanted to be uh, you know unexpected and we wanted to um, find you know these surprising combinations but we did like with four methyl methyl pentanoic acid we see that being uh, you know a, a common thread in in pizza and tomatoes and cheese um, and baked wheat and um, so I think you know you can and and in in my own research that I've been doing you know lately we. We certainly do find those, um, uh, you know, isopentanol is something that ties together bourbons and pecans, something, something we, we love well down here, uh, you know, down south. But I think, you know, so many, so, so many of the classic combinations, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot going on between tomatoes and basil. Uh, one of the strongest shared compounds, uh, or, you know, the, one of the strongest, um, pairings that I've ever seen is between olives and citrus. And that's, that's no surprise. You know, that's, we, we knew that, right? But I think there's even interesting things that you can pull out of that. Olives and citrus have about 60% of their compounds in common, which is an exceptionally high number of shared compounds. Um, and it makes sense because wherever olives grow, um, so do citrus fruits, right? right? You know, if you think about Southern Italy and kind of all around the Mediterranean, you've got olives and citrus, uh, citrus growing together everywhere. And I think, you know, with some of the engineers uh, behind the you know, chef Watson, we've kind of talked about this idea that there's, I think a, a lot of, a lot of the environment infuses these com, you know, infuses the compounds into the, into the ingredients. And so we are going to see a lot of, you know, regional, um, you know, commonalities um, with ingredients. But I think, you know, even with that, so, okay, yeah, olives and citrus, they go great together. We've always known that, you know, kind of every, uh, you know, everyone who's ever cooked a Mediterranean dish has put olives and citrus together and that's fine. Um, but also then, you know, for what that does to me is makes me go, well, but what else can we do with olives and citrus then? Why do we just, why do we just put that with fish? Right. Can't we do something else with that? And it, you know, has led me to. Um, I, ha I have a dessert in in the upcoming book that is uh, a lemon curd that gets finished with uh, extra virgin olive oil instead of butter, um, and sets up, and then gets a um, a crumbled topping, kind of a, a streusel almost, made with um, olive cure or olive or excuse me, oil cured olives, um, a little bit of rosemary and brioche crumbs and, you know, um, sweetened almonds. And it's the kind of this beautiful, savory, sweet, you know, really interesting dessert. And as you're, you know, crunching on these olives and they just kind of burst that brininess and saltiness into your mouth and um, they just go so well with the citrus, but they're just completely unexpected in a dessert. And so I think, you know, again, when we can, when you can focus your creativity and, and when you can start with a pairing and let that focus your creativity, you know, even, 
even the most common pairings can become unexpected. That sounds amazing. I want to eat that. (laughs) Um, So do you see computational creativity as a a method of breaking through various types of bias and blindness when it comes to the cultural underpinnings of cooking and opening up new territory? You know, that's, I mean, for me, that's the core of it. I think you're you're exactly right on with that. because I think we all have we all have our biases. I mean, we talked about it before with apples, right? If I'm cooking apples, I'm going for butter. No, I don't necessarily need to go for butter. I, I might want to consider olive oil because it is going to be more flavorful. You know, we talked about how, you know, in the process of creation, we kind of, you know, chefs tend to play that word association game and you just write duck at the top of your notepad and then start listing all the ingredients below it. Um, but those are all the things that we know, that we've seen before, that we've experienced before somehow. Um, and this is the key to that, that we're, we're looking at ingredients as a comp- you know, with a complete blank slate. And that was one of the really kind of interesting things for me about working through the Chef Watson project was learning to look at ingredients that way, to, to look at a tomato and not, you know, like slap my hand away from the basil. Like, nope, no, no basil with this one, you know, and, and kind of break free of what I thought was supposed to go with that ingredient and just kind of, oh, you know, somewhat follow blindly and go, okay, we're going to try this. It doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense, but we're, we're going to give it a whirl and see what happens. And we're going to find a way to make something great out of this. And, and, and then that's what we always did. So yeah, er- erasing those preconce- preconceived notions of, of what ingredient pairings are supposed to be true was the key, was the key to the project. And is, and, you know, again, kind of that there's, there's some excitement and freedom in, in letting go of that. Nice. Um, so I see there's a version of Chef Watson currently available on the web. Um, what do you see as the future of Chef Watson? Um, and will this hit the general public in a way that you can combine foods in your own home based on the computer uh, models? Yeah. So, you know, there's IBM Chef Watson dot com uh, that people can go to and, and check out and um, try it out themselves. And that's not the version that we um, worked with at the Institute of Culinary Education, um, but uh, but a very similar one that uh, they've. IBM has paired up with Bon Appetit to create these, um, uh, you know, to create this this engine that's kind of open to the public that they can um, kind of tweak Bon Appetit recipes um, in in their own unique way. And I think you know the most interesting thing is that you can put you know you can implant any type of filter you want. You can exclude certain ingredients. You can exclude certain types of ingredients. So if you want, you know, if you want an allergy-free, you know, recipe to create it, you can say no nuts, you can say no gluten, no, no, no wheat products or, you know, whatever it may be. And so um, I think, yes, you know, absolutely. I think this is a, a great thing for home cooks to play with and explore. Um, and, and, you know, and it's really interesting what comes out always at the end and, and can be surprising. And I think, you know, um, the IBM Chef you know, allows you a certain amount of of customization and selection. So you have to kind of fight your natural tendencies to go, well, I'm making a dish with tomatoes. Um, and it will suggest basil because basil is a good combination with tomatoes. But, you know, and, and if you want basil with your tomatoes, you certainly can have it. But, you know, challenge yourself to try to plug cardamom in there maybe instead one time and, and see what happens. Um, I honestly never got into uh, sous vide cooking until I started here at IHMC. Um, I respected, loved the places to eat there, like WD-50 and those sort of places, but never really used those methods myself. Um, I used sous vide cooking a lot, a little in London and Vancouver, but not really got into all that you can do with it. Um, but uh, when uh, Ken loaned me his uh, Modernist Cuisine cookbook and told me how much he liked the scientific part of cooking and the precision of sous vide, um, it really opened my eyes up to all the different ingredients you can cook sous vide and how powerful the flavors can become. Um IHMC has the whole setup now, and we just love it. Um, can you explain the basis of sous vide cooking and some of the reasons for its effectiveness and popularity? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I'm a, a big fan of sous vide cooking. We've been, we've, I've been teaching it now um, to both our students and professionals alike at ICE for, uh, well, about seven years now. Um, for, for those who may be unfamiliar, you know, sous vide literally means under vacuum. So, um, and again, back to us, how we screw up language all the time. Um, what we're really talking about is low temperature cooking. Um, vacuum sealing is not always necessarily involved in sous vide cooking. It's, it's typically better when it is. Um, but what we're really talking about is, is low temperature cooking and, and more, you know, very precise low temperature cooking. 
Um, so in if we were going to sous vide a chicken breast, we were going to season a chicken breast, put it inside a bag uh, to protect it from the water because it's going to go into a temperature controlled water bath and then be held at the exact degree of doneness that we want that chicken to be. So we're in traditional cooking, if we were you know, roasting a chicken in the oven, we've got the oven cranked up to 350 degrees, 400 degrees, whatever it may be, and we're trying to just land at 160. Well, that's a really, really tiny window of, of you know, equilibrium where 400 is beating down on the inside. It's starting at 70 degrees maybe internally, and we've got to capture it at that magical moment where and we have to kind of predict where that magical moment is going to be because if we pull it out right at 160, then that heat's going to keep radiating in for a little bit that's just kind of trapped on the exterior of the bird and it's going to lead to, you know, eventually an overcooked bird as it carries over. Um, with <clears throat> sous vide cooking, you're putting your food into an environment where the ambient temperature is the same as the temperature you want for an internal temperature or doneness. So if I want my you know, chicken breast cooked to 160 degrees, then I'm gonna set the water to 160 degrees. If I want my you know, soft poached egg cooked to exactly 146 degrees, then I put the water at 146 degrees. Um, so you get a precise level of doneness that can be very, very precisely controlled. And you have no danger, well, there's an eventual danger of overcooking. But you don't have, you know, this this precise short, short window of doneness. It's really funny when I'm first teaching people how to cook sous vide and we say that, you know, uh, a chicken breast or a steak needs to cook for 60 minutes. And so we set a water bath at 128 degrees. We seal a steak. We put it in and we set our timers for 60 minutes. And as soon as that timer goes off, you see people go sprinting across the kitchen to go pull it out as fast as they could. I'm like, guys, relax. That just, that's just telling us that now the temperature in the center of that steak is 128 degrees. But look, when I go stick my hand in the water, it's like the water's still 128 degrees as well. Now it's getting hot and I pull my hand out pretty quickly. But, you know, like if, if this sits here now or if we take it out now or if we take it out in 30 minutes, it's still going to be 128 degrees. You know, this is not going to overcook. It's not, uh, you know, so it's a different way to kind of approach the process, uh, approach the process of cooking. And it's, you know, a little bit of technology that allows for that precision. Um, and it's just really transformative in, in mm. so many, especially in, in the cookery of proteins. Yeah, sous vide has really improved the quality and consistency of the meals here at IGMC. That's, you know, and that's the key. It's, it's that consistency. It's that, you know, replication of I know what temperature I like my steak at and now I have a way to guarantee I'm going to serve the steak at that temperature at that level of doneness every single time I cook it. In the late uh, 70s and maybe up to about 1980 I uh, invented a super crude version of sous vide <laughs> when I was in the Navy. It probably accounts for some of my problems now because <laughs> the machine I used to vacuum pack the food was a megabucks machine for vacuum packing high value electronics. And I would put things <laughs> like chicken breasts in it. And uh, I'm sure this is past the, uh, this is probably safe to share now, but I, I put all <laughs> kinds of stuff in there and I would whack it, right? So this stuff was very compressed. And uh, I just uh, I knew nothing about sous vide. I just wanted to keep this food in good shape on a 13-hour flight. <laughs> and I would cook it uh, in a water bath because we, uh, we had a convection oven. That was it. And uh, so I, I, we had water heaters for making coffee and things like this. And so I would throw my little packet, you know, in, right. uh, in the water bath. And people were so jealous. They'd come by and they're eating, you know, a sandwich from the chow hall where the meat was green and, you know, <laughs> presumably somebody spit in it. And, uh, and they'd see me having something with a lovely sauce. And <laughs> <laughs> you were, we were well ahead of your time. Man. That's very impressive. But it wasn't like fine temperature <laughs> control. It was kind of like a seal a meal, you know. Right, the, like, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I couldn't imagine not having these tools now. Um, and, uh, after reading about you and Chef Washington, I was completely blown away. Um, what do you think will be the next big breakthrough in the culinary world? Oh, wow. Um, the next big breakthrough in the culinary world. I think, I think everything's going to shift to precision temperature control. 
Um, you know, I mean, uh, uh, we see poli science has their latest uh, appliance out called the Control Freak, which is essentially an, an induction top that has the same level of temperature precision that a, that a water circulated that a, a circulating water bath for sous vide does. And um, you know, I think uh, combi ovens are becoming more and more oh, yeah, popular, definitely. and yeah. like CVAP ovens. So I think you know. Now, as sous vide becomes more widespread, I think we're gonna everyone's gonna start looking um, to diff- f- looking to different ways of doing that precision temperature control uh, and low temperature cooking without necessarily having to vacuum seal and put it in a water bath. You know, if we can, if I can set an oven to you know 160 and cook chickens to 160 and in, in, you know, open in that oven um, where the skin is drying at the same time as, you know, we're getting a precise level of doneness, um, then, you know, that's just the next step. And that's even more now potentially that I can do with that. Never undercook or overcook again. Exactly. <laughs> that's great. Have you had a chance to play with the control freak? Uh, no, Dave, I don't know if you're listening, Dave at PolyScience, but, um, uh, somehow my box has not yet arrived at ice. Um, I have not, no, I have not. Um, I've seen it in use. Um, I got to push some buttons on it um, last year at uh, the Star Chefs International Chef Congress. Uh, the poli science guys were there and they were making some things off of it. Um, I mean, it's a really, that was one of the first demo pieces they had there, but it's a really impressive piece of equipment. Yeah, I, I, I've seen seen it, but I've never used it. And uh, we have poli science equipment here and I was thinking that would be a cool addition. It is. Yeah, it absolutely. I mean, just yeah, once again, I mean, that level of precision that you can add, that you can now add to anything. Yeah, very much so. Hey, could you talk to us a little bit about hydrocolloids, otherwise known as gums, uh, which have, for many people, really changed the way they cook? Ooh, they're these, they're these big, scary things, aren't they? Are. they? Could Hydro- you talk to us about this? Hydrocolloids. Ooh, scary. I'm chewing one. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, You know, we've had, people have had hydrocolloids in their kitchens for as as long as they've lived. Um, And they eat them on a daily basis. But for some reason, uh, we're scared of them and we call them chemicals. But flour and cornstarch are hydrocolloids. Anything that forms a gel in the presence of water is a hydrocolloid. And we have all of these great new ingredients that we get to use in our cooking that can transform textures. Um, and, and allow us to do foods with things that we, or things with food that we never imagined before. Um, xanthan gum probably being kind of the, uh, the intro, you know, that's like the uh, gateway drug to hydrocolloids is xanthan gum, which is just a phenomenally effective thickener. We typically use it in, um, you know, in quantities of less than a gram and it just thickens and emulsifies. Uh, and it's a super, super powerful starch derived from corn. Um, but then, you know, there are other incredible hydrocolloids. Most of them de- derived from seaweed uh, of some form, things like carrageenan and gelin and um, agar agar, you know, are some of my favorites to work with. And they form gels in different ways, you know, in different ways than gelatin. They're, they really kind of do uh, somewhat the same thing as gelatin, um, but are stronger, are more stable, have you know just better qualities that allow you to manipulate textures in a different way um, than you know simply working with gelatin. Gelatin is something that's always been around and something that everybody knows, and nobody's scared of gelatin. But if we hadn't heard of gelatin before, um, you know maybe we'd be scared of that too. But, uh, you know, I love working with them. We do, you know, spearification. I love making, um, we do a beautiful crab salad. It's with roasted poblanos and mint and fresh crab meat. And then we make a, a sphere of uh, mango puree. And you set that right on top of, you know, this little round of your molded crab salad. It looks exactly like an egg yolk sitting on top. And you tap it with a knife and it breaks in the skin and runs all over the crab salad just like an egg yolk would. Um, but... It's a mango puree. And, you know, we, I add a little bit of espalette pepper and a little bit of salt to it. So it's a little bit savory and spicy. Um, and it's just such a cool thing. And I think the way you can, you know, it's another way to add unexpectedness to, to a dish. Um, you know, tapioca maltodextrin um, being another one that, well, that's actually probably not technically a hydrocolloid, but, you know, that can absorb a fat and turn it into a powder. So we can make powdered olive oil, powdered peanut butter, uh, you know, powdered citrus oil, really, and, you know, anything um, that can just transform textures. And I think it's, you know, 
like sous vide, hydrocolloids are just another tool to have in your arsenal. Um, I absolutely love sous vide cooking, but I tell people that, you know, it doesn't mean you, you learn sous vide just the same way you learn how to braise at one point and the same way you learn how to grill at one point. It's, it's a very effective cooking technique and it has, you know, a lot of great applications, but it doesn't mean that now we have to cook everything sous vide. I might, but we don't have to. <laughs> it could happen. <laughs> it could. You know, people react, as you noted, oddly to the use of chemical names. And they imagine that chemicals are something apart from themselves. You know, you gave a terrific talk last night. Thank you. Thank you. And, and everybody loved it. But I heard one woman leaving. And she said, he uses chemicals. So there should be no chemicals in food. <laughs> and... uh We'd all be hungry, but I... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Not I was, quite sure what we would eat if we yeah. didn't eat chemicals. I was at a restaurant. <laughs> this actually happened. As a chef, you'll probably uh, imagine this interaction in the front of the restaurant, right? So I, I'm in a... Um, I don't want to say the name, but a well-known restaurant in Atlanta, right? Where we would probably recognize. And uh, there's a, a waitress, and she tells... She assures me about the... Uh, nature of the ingredients and it's very farm to table and that it's all organic and my wife kicked me under the table because she was afraid i was going to say yes of course food's organic but anyway <laughs> I, you know i i didn't say anything you know i let her go i, I knew she the use of the word i right. knew what she meant right so that was fine with this and then she proudly tells me there's no chemicals in the food <laughs> and and then i i, I said okay well uh, i have to leave then because I'm really hungry. <laughs> and she follows me to the door, you know, well, sir, sir, what's the problem? I said, I'm here to eat chemicals. And you said there are no chemicals in the food. <laughs> and she, I, I can't imagine what the conversation was like with her and the, the captain, you know, the door. I mean, right. it had to be, why did they leave? <laughs> <laughs> I told them there were no chemicals and he left. <laughs> He's some weird guy, which only wants to eat chemicals. Yeah, he won't live long. <laughs> so, speaking of delicious chemicals, uh, what do you eat today? Uh, um, so far, I've eaten a muffin and some coffee. That doesn't sound very <laughs> promising. Well, what are, what are your favorite foods? Um, the favorite foods, I mean, any piece of the pig is going to make me oh, really, yeah. really happy. Um, I mean, this, you know, gosh, I, I, we're, it's early August right now. And I just, I love this time of year. Um, I love everything that's around and available. This is, this is probably, you know, I don't know. I feel like in March and April, I say, this is my favorite time of the year to cook. And then come August and September, I say, no, this is my favorite time of the year to cook. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, I can, I can eat a watermelon, a large watermelon by myself and, and really just a matter of minutes. Oh, that's um, prodigious. One of my, <laughs> just one of my favorite things in the world. Um, but just all of this, you know, wonderful summer produce. I really do love, as much as I love, you know, pork and a great steak and, and, and all of that, um, the vegetables make me really happy. Um, and, and this time of year where we can start, you know, incorporating, you know, all of these wonderful fruits into savory foods as well, using things like watermelon and peaches and pickling them and, um, you know, just seasoning them with savory spices and incorporating them into dishes. Those are, those are kind of, that's kind of what I'm into right now. Mm, yeah, sounds we're, good. We're doing some new courses at ICE now where we're focusing on modernist cooking techniques, um, but exclusively with vegetables. Uh, so some, you know, kind of that modernist vegetarian approach. And, and we have a really, really, uh, it's actually also um, kind of originated from the Watson cookbook. Um, we make a, a, a secondary version of it that is a, a vegan ramen broth. Um, it's kind of like a, a vegan dashi on steroids that is really great with, with smoked uh, tofu and uh, dried shiitake, and ginger and garlic and scallions, of course. Uh, it comes out in soy sauce and just comes out with the just deepest, most most wonderful flavor. Mm. Dawn will be sorry she missed this interview. She's a, a vegetarian. Oh. Well, then I and then I drop some pork into it anyway. Oh, that, yeah, <laughs> that, I make the vegan ramen broth, but then yeah, that's slice what, some pork in anyway. That's what I would yeah. do. <laughs> and then I'd have it all for myself. So, so when you have a day off, and I don't want to get you in hot water <laughs> with all your chef friends, but uh, when you have a, you know, you're just going out with just you and Brooke. No kids. You're going out. Doesn't have to be a fancy place. But what are two or three or four of your 
favorite haunts in New York oh. City? Um, man, and it's such a it's such an ever evolving scene. Um, one of my favorite places, and, it, and it's a little bit of a fancy place, but you can get in there and be very comfortable and, and take it a little casual if you want. Is uh, is the Nomad, and they're just they're doing incredible things. I mean, it's it's kind of the kitchen crew bounces back and forth between Nomad and Eleven Madison Park, and you know what James Kent and those guys are are doing up there is just is so great and so thoughtful, and they have. Uh, you know, they're, they're a place that has just incredible veg- vegetable entrees. Um, you know, they kind of lead their entree menu with a few purely vegetarian dishes that are just really, really thoughtful and delicious and, and well put together. And I think one of those things they do is, is something that I love to do is, is they take a single ingredient and you know, present it to you on the plate in three or four different forms, which, which I was always really enjoy. And I always try to kind of layer a singular ingredient in, in different forms onto a plate. Um, but them and um, Gramercy Tavern is always, um, and, and I actually haven't made it over yet to uh, Michael's new, Michael Anthony's new place, Untitled, but everything I see from there, and they're just so, again, fresh and market-driven. I think it's really great. We recently ate at... Um, Antoine Westerman's new place, Le Coq Rico, um, which is almost right next to Gramercy Tavern. And that's a, you know, a, a chicken rotisserie joint that he uh, transferred over from Paris. And they spent months just visiting every different poultry farm in the Hudson Valley to find just the right chickens for them to throw on their rotisseries uh, you know, at the restaurant and just make incredible pommes frites to go along with that. And I mean, it's just a, a perfectly roasted bird and, and some mayonnaise and some French fries. And oh, that's hard uh, to it's beat. a pretty, it's a pretty yeah. happy place. Yeah. And we're also very fortunate. This is, um, this is usually daddy daughter date. Um, we live right around the corner from Dominique and Sells bakery, Ugh. uh, in the West village. So, uh, you know, he was, he was the pastry chef at Danielle at the time that I was there. So, have, you know, been fortunate to know him for quite a while and you know, often see him there at the bakery and he'll always pop around and offer us an, a nice little treat out of the you know Willy Wonka factory that that place is but it is <laughs> place uh, amazing it, it's so yeah. it's so great those are all great great choices you know you and your wife Brooke Parkhurst are both hail from Pensacola and when you're back in Pensacola or in the south in general um, there must be some foods that you're <laughs> eager to get a hold of. Could you tell us about that? <laughs> you know, I, ha- I hate to, to come here and just start feeding into, into stereotypes, but man, fried food, mm. good good fried seafood. Chets. Yes. Yep. Uh, so, you know, Brooke's family who, who has uh, some property out in Pace and a lot of them, uh, you know, live there t- um, in, in kind of the same little neighborhood, uh, have had a longstanding tradition of every Sunday morning. You know, or a, a brunch at Chet's. Um, so yes, those fried mullet and and snapper throats and, yeah. and everything else. The uh, the mullet backbones, yes, are, uh, are good. <laughs> and uh, the uh, mullet, I, 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 mullet row, I've never no, never I, really gotten a taste for. It, you should skip that. <laughs> uh, uh, there's a very there's a very famous uh, food writer who I. I shall not out right now. I know who, I know who it is. <laughs> uh, and, uh, I, I brought him to Chet's, the original Chet's, which is still my favorite. You know, the one, the one uh, I think it's Navy Boulevard, you know, the original yeah. Chet's. And um, he said, well, uh, you know, give me the full Monty. You know, I want the marinated flounder. <laughs> and I said, well, you want the special things that aren't on the menu? And of course, oh, yes, I will. I'm very cool. I can eat all the special things. So first out <laughs> came mullet backbones, and this was a marvel. And then out came mullet gullet. You know, mullet have these, you know, gullet thing. And uh, they were fried, and they were really good. Uh, and then out came two kinds of mullet roe. And the waitress says, well, we have the regular roe. Uh, and he eats it and goes, oh, it's terrible. It's so salty. <laughs> it, it's so bad. And then she looks at me and says, you know, this is advantage of being a local. She looks at me and says, "Well, what do you think? Do you think he's uh, he prefer the other row, the white row?" <laughs> I said, "Oh yeah, this guy definitely prefer the white row." And uh, she brings out the right white row, and he exclaims, "This is much better!" And then after he <laughs> ate most of it, we explained what it was. Well, that it was we, not. S- we said there exactly are boy right. mullet and girl mullet. <laughs> <laughs> 
He was an unhappy camper. Oh, man. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I love, you know, and, and you know, truly when, when we're home, it's such a treat to have a big kitchen to work in as opposed to our, you know, yeah, New, York New York City, City. apartment. Um, so just to go down to Joe Patty's and get some great fresh seafood yeah. and, and do it ourselves, um, you know, is, is also a treat to be down here. Yeah, the seasonality of the, not just the produce, but the seafood as well. Yes. You know, this Kobe are running or the pompano are out. Yes. You know, oh. you go hammer some pompano. Go find some pompano on the ice there. It's yeah. a wonderful thing. Yeah, pompano is one of uh, the best inventions. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I thought of that. STEM Talk is an educational service of the Florida Institute for Human and Machine Cognition, a not-for-profit research lab pioneering groundbreaking technologies aimed at leveraging and extending human cognition, perception, locomotion, and resilience. You know, you've authored three books, one of which with your wife, I mentioned Brooke, and uh, could you just quickly tell us about uh, those three books and they're each quite different. I've I look, looked at them and we'll put them links to them in the show notes. Yeah, they they, they really are quite different. Um, so the, the first cookbook that I ever wrote, and that was one that I wrote with my wife, Brooke, who's, who's an incredible writer um, and sort of how this idea of us doing a cookbook came about. She, she wrote a novel before our cookbook that included what recipes about a Southern girl moving to New York City. Uh, called Belle and the Big Apple. But then um, our first cookbook was Just Married and Cooking. And it was the book that we wrote during our first year of being married as we were trying to figure out what this whole being married thing was. And it was a lot of, you know, the thing I love about that book and, and still do, and I still kind of go back to it and go, oh, man, I forgot about that recipe, though. That was actually a pretty good one. <laughs> we should make that again. Um, but I can open to any page in that book and, and point to a recipe and kind of tell you the, tell a story behind the first time that we cooked that or, you know, from a trip we went on together and had that thing and then came home and recreated it, which is, which is something we love to do is to travel and discover new things and then uh, recreate them once we get back home. Um, and that, so that's what, you know, Just Married and Cooking was all about. It was kind of these everyday meals that we made for ourselves and the fun food we made when we were having friends over to entertain or, um, you know, also kind of, you know, uh, a big section of the book is called New Traditions, which as a married couple is something you've got to figure out that it's, it's, it's our Thanksgiving now. Um, you know, what are we going to do? What kind of things, what traditions do we want to create that are going to be our own? Um, so that was the first book. And then, um, Last year, 2015, two two separate books came out. One was called The Great Cook, which I partnered with Cooking Light to do. So we consulted with Cooking Light on all of the recipes, and they're all you know meet Cooking Light standards of um, you know calories per portion and sodium and, and you know all of these things. So they're good, healthful recipes. Um, but the book is called The Great Cook, and it's really kind of all of these great dishes that any cook should know. Um, and what I, you know, they kind of came to me with this concept and, and said, you know, you're a good cooking teacher and we want this book to feel like you're kind of sitting there at the kitchen counter with the reader, with the cook and coaching them through how to make these things that maybe they, they weren't so sure they could do like a cocoa van or a beef stew or even a simple whole grilled fish. Um, they did a phenomenal job with the photography. There's beautiful step-by-step -step photos throughout Yeah, they're the really beautiful. I mean, really just good. such such a great job they did with that. And then, you know, it's kind of, you know, I just said, all right, so you're going to grill a whole fish today. You know, here's a couple of things you need to know about doing that. Um, and you need to be really careful when you try to take it off of the grill because the fully cooked fish is a very delicate thing. And, you know, you may feel silly, but you should actually get out two spatulas and lift it off the grill very carefully because if you grab it with your tongs, it's going to fold in half and fall into the coals. Um, so, you know, get to kind of offer my advice um, as, as you work your way through the recipes. And then um, also last year, the Chef Watson cookbook came out, which was kind of the chronicle of... Um, all of the first recipes we created from the very first one um, with the Spanish almond crescent uh, was the very first recipe we ever created with Watson, um, which every, every Watson recipe is inspired by uh, a single ingredient, a cuisine style, and a dish type. 
Um, so they all have these these sometimes funny sounding names like a Spanish almond crescent. But basically what we wanted to do is we wanted to create a, a pastry for a breakfast meeting. And um, I love Spanish food and I love Spain. So mm. I was like, well, let's do a Spanish one. And um, the ingredient, you know, we always often kind of, you know, think about this in the context of the TV shows that we watch that the ingredient is like, is the main ingredient has to be featured some way. It's the almond is merely kind of a, a seed for Watson to build the flavor pairings off of. And it may be just some, you know, toasted almonds sprinkled over the top and the flavors that dominate may come from other things. You know, in this case, saffron, black pepper, cocoa, and uh, coconut milk were really, you know, interesting combinations and a, and a bit of a challenge to work into a pastry. Um, but we did. But that's what the Chef Watson book is. It's sort of a chronicling of, you know, everything that we did in in the development of Watson. And, you know, I, it's a beautiful book, again, with just incredible photography. And, um, you know, I often caution people that this probably a book they're not going to cook anything out of because as you know we approached each recipe we created with watson again it was to be as creative and unexpected as possible and i think you know between myself and michael lascanas the other chef uh working on the project at ice i think there was always a a bit of a one up one upmanship Mm. that we wanted to um make the dishes as visually appealing and intricate um and complicated as we possibly could make them um you know it was, it's a it's a little bit it was, it's a showcase yeah. uh, and, and that's what it is so it's a beautiful book and i think an interesting read and a lot of fun recipes and you might you know pull portions of recipes that you want to you know try out and incorporate or devote a full day to tackling one of the recipes mm, which is, yeah. it can be a fun project yeah and that can be true too for some classic you know French cuisine. Absolutely. You can sign up for a day. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. Is the duck dish in that book? The duck the, dish, yes. Oh, uh, man. The, the dueling duck dishes with the olive oil poached apples and the yeah. and the olive and cherry jam is in yeah, there. That, that, that sounds good. Going back to our discussion of when you're back in Pensacola, um, so you, you mentioned that you enjoy going to Joe Patty's, and for those who don't know, it's a, you know, it's a grocery store-sized fish market. And uh, there are several really great fish markets here, and Joe Patty's is a legend. It's one of them. And uh, we uh, and do you go to Chet's when you're in town here? We uh, we often do. I know that it's not a place we make every trip, right. but um, you know we we do uh, <laughs> we do love Chet's and Jerry's as well. Yeah, yeah Jerry's great yeah, for right. a, for a bacon cheeseburger and a milkshake. Yeah. I mean. I see those are insider secrets. Right? I had to introduce my daughter to yeah. to those a couple a couple years back, and I was I was actually very excited. It's a place we used to go every Friday night after the football after the high school football game. We would go, you know, roll into Jerry's and for some milkshakes, and um, one person would get wild and order the chicken gizzards, and yeah, we would each have a couple bites and be content with that. And, uh, a full basket of chicken gizzards is tough. It is. It's <laughs> too tough for me. But when. Uh, when I have visitors in town, especially people from New York City uh, or San Francisco, but New York mostly, especially if they're food writers or some other way uh, prominent chefs, uh, I don't take them to our fine dining restaurants. I, I'll bring a, some excellent wine, some high quality wine glasses, and we have a whole feast at Chet's. We <laughs> at devour Chet's. every aspect <laughs> of fish. And uh, if you make it to Chet's, I recommend the marinated flounder. Marinated and, flounder. And if they don't have that, get the marinated grouper. It's equally good. But the um, there's a great story about Jerry's. Is uh, it was uh, somebody you would know fr- fr- uh, flies in, and uh, they're exhausted. Uh, they had a travel experience like you did yesterday. <laughs> you know, it was trains, planes, and automobiles, and they were 30 hours late. I pick him up at the airport, and uh, he says, I, I, I just have to eat something. What, what should we do? And so I said, let's go in here. I don't warn him. So we're sitting at the, you know, at the bar area. I order two pieces of uh, fried oysters, just two. That's all I wanted. And he says, you can't get two. He's a chef, right? He said, you can't get, they're not going to serve you two fried oysters. I said, well, yeah, <laughs> they'll, they'll be better because the oil will be hot. I'm just going to have two. And so he ended up eating about, 
two dozen fried o- <laughs> once he got his fangs into fried oysters. Oh, and, and, that was the next place I was going. I mean, you know, being down here and and, and, and cold beer, the yeah. local oysters, and going out to uh, Peg Legs and yeah. having some baked oysters and, and a couple cold beers on the deck. Yeah, I told him after you ordered several, you should stop ordering by two. <laughs> <laughs> now that is annoying. <laughs> Hey, I, I I understand that you and your wife Brooke are working on a developing a new TV show. Can you give us a little backstory on that and tell yeah. us some stuff? Um, so it's very exciting. We, um, you know, after after you know the experiences on Chopped and kind of uh, appearing and uh, occasionally in in other projects that the Food Network would have going on as a as a local expert or whatever it may be, um, you know. They're, they're really into kids and cooking these days. And, you know, we're seeing, you know, and which I, which I think is a wonderful thing because teaching our kids about good food and, and how to eat well and how to make their own food is, is something that got lost, I feel like, for at least a generation. And, um, you know, now that food is everywhere and, and cool, uh, you know, kids, kids are into it. And, and that's just a great habit to build early. So, um, Food Network had this concept for a show and they wanted to see what it was like for a chef to cook at home with his kids um, and what that looked like. And so they kind of put out, they put this idea out and put out a call and some friends of friends got in touch with me and um, we wound up putting together the show called Cooking with Dad, um, which the first two episodes are available now on foodnetwork.com and we've just shot a few more episodes. It'll be up soon. and. Uh, there's even more to come down the line there. And it's really just kind of like a glimpse of, of what it looks like when, uh, I mean, the show is called Cooking with Dad, but it's me and Brooke and, and our daughter who's seven and our son who's 14 months and, you know, the havoc he wreaks and, and, and that we all kind of, you know, endure um, and what it's like for for a, a chef and, and really, you know, a, a husband and wife who are, who are two both very good cooks. Um to just put dinner on the table every night and, 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 you know, or put a snack together for after tap class or, uh, you know, make, finally have a Sunday morning off and just make breakfast together, you know, kind of what that looks like. And, you know, we like to, my daughter's really into it and loves to spend time with us in the kitchen and wants to be involved in everything. So we just kind of hang out in the kitchen and, and be silly and, and try to cook fun things. Yeah, that, uh, I, I predict great success for that show. Oh, thank you. I hope so. Well, uh, thank you for the wonderful talk last night where there were like over 300 people at your talk. And thank you for the fascinating conversation on STEM Talk. Thank you, Ken and Blake. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. I'm going to order the uh, couple of those books after we leave here. (laughs) And thank you, uh, Chef Blake, for joining us on STEM Talk. Thanks. STEM Talk. STEM Talk. STEM STEM Talk. talk. STEM STEM Talk. talk. STEM Talk. I very much enjoyed interviewing James Brissione, and it was great to have Chef Blake Rushing co-host this episode. This episode combined two of my favorite topics, the science of food spiced with a touch of AI. Yeah, I'm sorry to have missed this episode and this excellent lecture at IHMC, a link to which will be included in the show notes. I invite you to visit the STEM Talk webpage where one can find the show notes for this episode and find pointers to James's books, and the link to his aforementioned lecture at IHMC, stemtalk.us. Ken, you and Blake Rushing did such a great job with this interview. Blake and James seem to really connect as both are first-rate chefs who grew up in the same area and share a passion for the kitchen. Thanks, Don. It was great fun for me as well, and I strongly recommend that folks watch the video arising from James' lecture here at IHMC. And as Don mentioned, uh, one can find it at IHMC's website and on YouTube. This is Don Carnegie signing off for now. And this is Ken Ford saying goodbye until next time we meet on STEM Talk. Thank you for listening to STEM Talk. We want this podcast to be discovered by others. So please take a minute to go to iTunes to rate the podcast and perhaps even write a review. More information about this and other episodes can be found at our website, stemtalk.us. There, you can also find more information about the guests we interview.